for the Wild is brought to you in part by the Calliopeia Foundation. We are grateful for their continued support and the support of grassroots contributions from listeners like you. Learn more at calliopeia.org. To make a donation, visit forthewild.world/donate or find us on Patreon. If you'd like to support us in other ways, consider sharing our episodes through social media or leaving us a review wherever you listen to the podcast. Hello and welcome to For the Wild podcast. I'm Ayana Young. Today I'm speaking with Dr. Rupa Maria and Raj Patel. But there is a biological impact of a social structure that has been put forth to us as if it were inevitable and unchangeable. And it is exactly you know, the opposite. It is changeable and it is something we can avoid. Dr. Rupa Maria is a physician, an activist, a mother, and a composer. She is an associate professor of medicine at the University of California, San Francisco, where she practices and teaches internal medicine. She is a co-founder of the Do No Harm Coalition, a collective of health workers committed to addressing disease through structural change. She is a co-founder of the Deep Medicine Circle, an organization committed to healing the wounds of colonialism through food, medicine, story, and learning. Working with her husband, the agroecological farmer Benjamin Farr, and the association of the Rama Tush Ohlone, she is a part of the Farming is Medicine project, where farmers are recast as ecological stewards and rematriated land and food is liberated from the market economy. She has toured 29 countries with her band, Rupa and the April Fishes. Raj Patel is a research professor at the University of Texas at Austin's Lyndon B. Johnson School of Public Affairs, a professor in the university's Department of Nutrition, and a research associate at Rhodes University, South Africa. He is the author of Stuffed and Starved and the New York Times bestselling The Value of Nothing and the co-author of A History of the World in Seven Cheap Things. A James Beard Foundation Leadership Award winner, he is the co-director of a groundbreaking documentary on climate change and the global food system, The Ants and the Grasshopper. He serves on the International Panel of Experts on Sustainable Food Systems and has advised governments worldwide on the causes and solutions to crises of sustainability. Well, Rupa and Raj, this is so lovely to have you back on For the Wild podcast as a team. Like I was mentioning, both of your individual episodes were so stunning and moving, and I really want to direct listeners to both of those episodes in the archives. And uh, so happy to have you both back. So thanks for being here today. Thank you for having us. Well, as we start off, I'd like to invite listeners to learn about your new collaborative work, Inflamed, Deep Medicine and the Anatomy of Injustice. And in it, you write, quote, your body is part of a society inflamed. COVID has exposed the combustible injustices of systemic racism and global capitalism. Demagogues around the world kindle distrust and hatred. Governments send in the police to impose order monitor lockdowns, enforce a return to work for those who comply, and incarceration for those who do not. Everything we've made, we've made from fossil fuels, energy, food, medicine, and consumer goods. The world has been organized to burn. End quote. <sighs> so, you know, being inflamed in the ways we are is not a natural state. And we've arrived at this point because of deliberate actions. So I'd love if you could both reflect on what it means to exist within inflamed bodies and inflamed environments. You know, when you say to live inflamed is not, I, I don't know if you said natural. Um, I would say that our inflammatory response, the response of the body to damage is inflammation and it's a healing response. And so to just lay on a little compassion that our bodies are, are doing what they do to try to heal in the midst of ongoing incessant damage. And that state of being inflamed should tell us that we are in a situation 
where we are encountering um, damage. And that that can point us to how um, we can get, we can achieve or um, create a world that doesn't inflame our bodies, that doesn't inflame our planet. And so I, I think of inflammation as a guidepost, as a way of knowing, you know, are we on the right path or not? And what we see with the rise of chronic inflammatory disease all over the world in places that have been shaped through colonial capitalism in places we call modern industrialized countries or places, we see a, a, an enormous amount of damage and toll on the human body and on the earth's body and on our societies. And so it's a, um, you know, in some way, it's a real gift that our bodies have this alarm system and it's, and it's ringing nonstop. Our job now is to listen to it and to, and to follow what it's saying. I think that's one of the reasons why we wrote Inflamed uh, is because it's also possible to live, uh, uh, you know, in this world filled with inflammation and to remain in denial. Uh, and in fact, capitalism, a colonial capitalism requires that we do remain in denial. And so, uh, you know, it's entirely possible, for instance, you know, this is just a sort of a rip from the headlines observation that uh, you know, on the same day that the um, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service announced uh, the extinction of uh, more than a dozen uh, species just from the United States alone, uh, that our Secretary for Agriculture uh, were announced that uh, he didn't approve of the European Union's pesticide policy because it, it restricted things, and what we needed was more free markets. And you know, the people who were really blazing the trail on this were the Brazilians. And so, you know, it's it's entirely possible to to have all these signals and to meet them with a kind of grave cognitive dissonance, uh, because capitalism doesn't permit the kind of diagnosis, the kind of storytelling that uh, we we set to to to, to share in Inflame. Oh, thank you so much, um, both of you, for laying the foundation for this conversation with that. And I wanted to bring up that. Our modern life brings us into contact with a high degree of non-genetic drivers of health and illness, which you call the exposome. So can you explain first what this exposome is and how thinking of health from the perspective of the exposome may challenge our notions of what is healthy and what degree of health is even possible in a world of overconsumption and climate crisis? When it comes to chronic inflammatory disease, um, so the diseases that most people will encounter in their lifetimes if they live in a society constructed through colonial capitalism, which includes you know, most of the global North and now some of the global South, is are these diseases like cardiovascular disease or diabetes or cancer um, and cancer in increasingly younger people. Um, I just saw a 34 year old lady with you know, widely metastatic colon cancer, which is becoming increasingly common. All of these diseases are diseases where chronic inflammation is playing a role in how the diseases manifest. And um, what we know by studying genetically identical twins is that these diseases, environment and socio social and environmental factors are more predictive of the onset of these diseases than even genetic factors. Um, and that becomes really important when we think about how we manage them on a population level. Um, that you know, focusing on individual risk or individual strategies um, really becomes um, a futile way of having a, 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 you know, a, a measurable outcome difference on a population level of these diseases. And you know, the more um, you know, as countries like India or you know um, countries in Africa become industrialized or modernized, um, what happens shortly thereafter is a rise in these kinds of diseases. Um, so it is necessary for us to understand what the diagnosis is. Um, so if we're constantly looking at diabetes as just a dysfunction of pancreatic cells or dysfunction of our own cells responding to insulin, then we're not really looking at why is there a global rise in diabetes in societies that have been shaped through this mindset, this, this colonial mindset. 
Um, and, and when you start looking upstream in the social factors that are driving these diseases, then you can start to actually make changes that will have um, outcomes, different outcomes. And so that's why we focus in the book on, on really outlining where the pathology is. It's not in our bodies. Our bodies are responding quite healthily to a pathological world. And if we want to start to see differences in health outcomes, we have to start redesigning that pathological world. And we have to redesign it in ways that are antithetical to the understandings of colonial capitalism. So the mentality of extraction, the mentality of othering, um, whether it be people who are brown, black, or differently abled, or women, or of different genders, or the water and the mountains and the salmon. Um, so the, the level of othering that had to happen in order for colonialism to achieve its aims has deeply damaged our relationships to each other, and um, that has had consequences for our own bodies. And so diagnosis has to be precise, and it has to be accurate. And so that is what we are trying to offer in this book, is a another level of diagnosis so that we can um, make um, base our actions off of a real understanding of why we are sick. And to, to, to pick up what Rupert put down there, the, the idea of diagnosis is something that, I mean, when doctors are diagnosing, they're telling a story and they're telling a story from uh, a, a sort of, a, a, you know, a narrative vocabulary uh, that uh, is itself a, a product of this colonial capitalism. And so th there are certain ways in which, um, you know, if if we're thinking about individual pathologies, then it's always the victim that is at some level at fault. Uh, you know, if, if diabetes is something that happens inside your pancreas and therefore is something that you you yourself are responsible for, then, you know, at some level, you know, the, the, there's always the sort of victim blaming that, that, that accompanies uh, the, the, you know, the, the sort of narratives of, uh, dysfunction and disease. But when you break open diagnosis to be able to say, look, you know, one of the things that uh, is generative of uh, suicidal ideation is debt and the horror of losing or not being able to provide for one's family. And if that is true, and you know, we, we have plenty of resources in the book to, to show that it is, then the kinds of payday loans that uh, working class Americans uh, and you know, working class people around the world, but particularly Americans, take in order to be able to, to bridge uh, you know, the food running out to the arrival of the next paycheck. Those kinds of loans come with you know, interest rates of uh, APR of 600%. And if we were to eliminate them, uh, we would see suicide drop by 1.9% and accidental drug overdose rates drop by 8.9%. Uh, but what this means is that the exposome is a way of understanding uh, that the, the social forces act on everyone. I mean, even if you feel like you haven't been othered, you are a straight white guy, uh, if you are part of the working class, then you too have been uh, it, you know, oppressed, and of course, you know the 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 reason we we bring in both the colonial and the capitalism is to show that this is an ongoing process uh, in which you know, workers across the world are, are being uh, wrung dry, uh, and and that's not happening equally. It's happening along these colonial fault lines that Rupert was just talking around. Uh, so, you know, if, if we're interested in the story that knits this together, as opposed to a story that says, well, this is an individual problem over here, and uh, over here is some other entirely unrelated problem around species extinction, and it is an entirely unrelated thing about climate change, um, then you, you are going to silo your responses. But if your diagnosis is as global as the problem and as systemic as the problem, uh, and we talk a lot in this book about us being systems within systems, then you know, our, our responses have to be equally s systematic. And have to start dissolving this idea of you know the sort of uh, atomic individual that was created by colonial capitalism in the first place. Yeah, gosh, there's so much there in both of your responses, and oh, I'm thinking through the degree of exposure, you know, it just makes me wonder about the ways we often lack a deeper understanding about what environmental health means. And throughout the book, you connect our health as individuals to the health of our ecosystems. You know, be that the rivers that connect us, the salmon that feed us, or the soil that grows our food. And in many ways, our own health mirrors that of the earth. But this cannot remain metaphor alone. The earth is so clearly 
I mean, I want to say that the earth is so clearly hurting right now. And Raj, I'm particularly thinking about your background in researching global food systems. What is at risk when we lose connections to our waterways, foodways, and lifeways? Well, I mean, we've already experienced the, the consequences of thinking that food is the, the sort of thing that appears magically on the supermarket shelf. Uh, and that is uh, a disconnection, of course, with the hands that tend uh, the food uh, and with the people behind the food. And as Rupa was saying, you know, th those people are not just field workers or farmers or grocery uh, store clerks, but they are also rivers and, uh, you know, the, the microbial, uh, microbial life of the soil uh, and the, the winds and the rain. Uh, and by forgetting that and by uh, commodifying food and being subject to uh, you know the the narratives of you know food always on demand uh, but with never with people in the picture uh, and again using that broad conception of people that we use in the book then we lose not only uh, the, the the capacity for understanding our connections with one another but also our allies, our friends, uh, the, 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 the care that we can give and the care that we receive and we are currently receiving. But if we don't acknowledge that, if we, don't, if we aren't sensitive to it, if we, aren't, uh, if, if we have our capacity for care eroded by the market, and you know, it, it's abundantly clear now uh, that Adam Smith was wrong. Uh, Adam Smith uh, believed that when people get together and transact in a market, uh, they are made more cosmopolitan and made more aware of the world and it, in all its diversity. But uh, you know, increasingly, a range of very interesting experimental economics um, has pointed out that people, in fact, care less for one another when they interact each other, with each other through the market. Uh, and of course, the beings that don't transact with us in the market are entirely peripheral to, to our, our vision of what the world is when we look at the world through the goggles and money. So what we lose are uh, our fellow beings. And what we lose are the cultures in which we sing those fellow beings and when we recognize them and uh, in which knowledge uh, drawn from and shared with uh, and taught by these fellow beings is uh, cast to the wind only to be uh, snatched back occasionally when it turns out that there may be some therapeutic benefit to say, uh, you know, tending for our microbiome. Uh, but again, the, the only ways in which this this vast knowledge becomes then commercially useful is precisely when it can be uh, condensed into a pill for us to swallow, but never to be sung and to be shared and to be exchanged freely. So that's what we we, we lose a great deal, and uh, not only have we lost a great deal, but we stand to lose uh, everything that matters to us if we if we don't reestablish these connections. I just think that that is such a brilliant way of understanding and framing you know, what we are facing. And, um, you know, when we look at the microbiome of the gut and the body and how many individuals you could say, or how many collections or communities of other organisms are so vital for a proper response of our immune system, the proper development of our nervous system, the training of our endocrine system, it becomes abundantly clear that our well-being is completely dependent upon the other, um, you know, all these entities that are in and around us and that reach out into the world and form that ecotone or that transition zone between my body, the universe inside of me and the universe outside. Um, and so, you know, the, the misunderstanding of, you know, colonial capitalist approaches of, oh, well, we can just then you know, a culture, a, you know, an indigenous person in the uh, Amazon's gut microbiome culture, their feces and give it to people in little pills that re reflects the deep misunderstanding because this microbiome that is so vital for our health is a living reflection of all of our relationships. It is not a commodity um, that can easily be, you know, bought and sold. And so it is a, such a moment of awakening for us as, um, you know, as creatures, um, as people, um, as doctors, as people involved in health um, and wellness to uh, critically look at the storylines that we've been told and where they're failing us and, and, and look to storylines that have been more robust and um, lasted much longer um, that have continued to nurture biodiversity and health um, and excel at that. And so it's a, it's a great time of um, changing the narrative. 
Mm -hmm. I feel like you both are really speaking to this interconnectedness of so many worlds and whether it be our more than human kin or our communities of other humans or our ecosystems. And, you know, it's interesting because even though this interconnectedness is so clearly uh, true, um, this individualistic philosophy that we live under, you know, in dominant culture really ignores our dependence upon other beings. And it also, I think, just shows how this strict neoliberal individualism dictates much of how we go about the world. And I'm wondering, how did we get to this point? And particularly in medicine, what tradition does this represent? Uh, I mean, I can talk a little bit about the, the reason that we, we use the, the idea of colonial capitalism. And the, the, the reason that it's, it's important to have both those terms is because uh, while colonialism has been happening for a while, and in fact, uh, colonialism, uh, when it was conducted by the Romans, uh, gives us you know, the, the language of some of our medical terminology. You know, when the Romans were busy colonizing the Mediterranean, uh, they uh, had to invent a term for cities that were uh, not subject to the same sorts of duties that Rome was. So you could be part of the Roman Empire, but you weren't quite Roman uh, because you were immunis. Um, also, you, you were... Uh, part of uh, a, a city that was free and not subject to the same duty. So that, in, in Latin, that's immune, uh, or civita, civitatis libere et immunes. So munera is the, the, the term for duties, and so you don't have to do them immunes. Uh, and so from there, immunity uh, comes. And, and what we'll talk a little bit, I think, about how uh, the language of self and other uh, and the borders and the, the forces that, that marshal along those borders are, are, are part of modern medicine. But you know, the, the in addition to colonialism projecting a certain kind of institutionalized difference, uh, capitalism uh, deploys that with uh, an additional kind of ferocity by by uh, turning the world into society and nature. And this sort of cleavage um, of the the two is important to observe because if you're thinking about what is exploitable, what is it that we can cast to the winds? What is it that we can set fire to? What is it that we can work to death? Uh, then nature falls in that in that category. And so you have to be outside society in order to be exploitable. Inside society, it's you know usually propertied white Christian men that started off society and then gradually through struggle, more, more people were able to enter society. Uh, and that struggle is far from over. But the, uh, the, the, the sort of operation of power between uh, you know, society on the one hand and nature on the other uh, is one that is ongoing. And it's a process of domination that really, you know, we can date to the 1400s in particular, uh, really to 1492 and the, you know, the, 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 the invasion of the Western Hemisphere by, um, by colonial capitalists from Europe. But that, that was accompanied by a certain vision of medicine. I, 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 and I want to hand it over to Rupa here. Yes, and that pervades, you know, if you look at the colonization of lands around the world, medicine was a part of that project. So these lands were colonized by missionaries, medics, and militaries. And medicine, you know, looking at tropical medicine was basically developed to keep Europeans healthy in in other, you know, territories so that they could exploit the land, the resources, the labor, the people. Um, it wasn't there to keep, you know, the, the indigenous or native populations healthy. Um, and then when it was extended to the native populations, it was only because they realized that disease could spread um, sort of where we are today, you know, fast forwarding several hundred years to COVID. Um, and we still haven't seemed to learn our lesson. And so those ways of thinking pervade the, you know, modern medical mindset where, you know, you have in the hospital um, where, you know, I'm sitting here at the hospital right now, um, where people don't look, you know, that where, where patients personhood is, is, you know, degraded. Um, the way that we learn in medicine does not uphold or uplift a patient as the expert in their body and their disease. Um, often, you know, doctors are interrupting patients um, within the first minute of, of discussion. Um, so we are not trained to um, understand how um, to listen or how to value um, the expertise and personhood of, 
other people on the healthcare team of nurses. Um, so the whole hierarchies and systems of medicine fall along these class, race, and other social hierarchies that actually prevent us from giving excellent care. Um, and that's really where the work of decolonizing and understanding you know, how to work together in other ways that um, uplift and bring into the fold um, other uh, knowledge systems, other ways of knowing, and other experiences that can deepen and really enrich in, um, an understanding of disease and an understanding of how to get better. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, Another thing that you both mention in the book is the allostatic load or the chronic buildup of stress that comes with being Black in America, saying, quote, To be Black in the United States is to be confronted with daily acts of discrimination, sources of stress that manifest as higher blood pressure even while we are asleep. Instead of the restoration that sleep and melatonin afford, The allostatic load that racism brings effectively leaves Black people sleeping with one eye open, end quote. So I'm wondering, what are the tangible impacts of having such a high allostatic load? So that study that we were looking at there is is just such an intense study that showed that, you know, usually when people fall asleep, you get a dipping in your blood pressure, um, which, you know, your body is relaxed, um, your hormones are relaxed, um, and your blood pressure falls. And what they found is that um, Black Americans don't have that dipping. And I, I believe in that study, they compared it to Black Africans. Um, so it wasn't a genetic thing, which people love to say. Um, It is from the social conditions of being Black in America. And so that reality of being in a state of chronic stress um, is not saying that there's like a biologically essential, you know, predetermined fate of being sick um, if you're Black, but there is a biological impact of a social structure that has been put forth to us as if it were inevitable and unchangeable. And it is exactly you know, the opposite. It is changeable and it is something we can avoid. Um, and what we see when we talk about health disparities, you know, whether it's COVID or um, you know, cardiovascular disease or stroke or Alzheimer's, um, is that you know, oh, Black folks have worse outcomes, Indigenous people have worse outcomes. Well, this must be from you know, poor access to health care. Yes, that's a part of it, but that's not the whole story. Um, and the whole story isn't also just, you know, the, you know, oh, well, you just didn't have enough money or you just didn't have enough X, Y, Z. It's the whole architecture of society has been built to crush the bodies of Black, Indigenous, and uh, Latinx folks in this country. Um, and, in, and around the world, you see similar dynamics with caste in India, you know, these systems of domination that have been put in place that degrade our relationship to each other and that make oppression, a daily reality, it's impacting our body's ability to even get rest and restore. Um, And so poor health outcomes for folks suffering under that, you know, under that gradient are going to be inevitable, which to me as, you know, a doctor in the hospital where I'll see people come in, it, it feels like, and this is what we talk about in the book, this is a form of biological warfare. That, you know, if our societies never give us an opportunity to be healthy, 
that's where the predetermination comes in. It's not from our genes. It's not like there's people who are, you know, genetically predisposed to being unhealthy. Um, but if the world around them is constructed in a way that will ensure their poor health, they're going to be unhealthy. So how do we collectively work across lines to make a different outcome, to change the script, to change the, um, to change what's happening? And, you know, when I, I just gave a presentation at the um, UC level around their climate justice work, and, you know, someone's response was, oh, you know, but changing capitalism is so big. And like, how do we do this? And, you know, other people are like, well, this is, you know, capitalism is too big to fail, or it's too big for us to imagine this. And these are some of the same arguments that came around when the U.S. had slavery and people who were very invested in keeping chattel slavery in place would come up with these same arguments. Like, this is just too essential. This is too necessary. Um, and it's time for us to say no, like the abuse of the earth and the abuse of each other. Um, the abuse towards especially black and brown bodies, it's not necessary. It's not essential. Um, and if this economic system requires it, then let's get rid of this economic system. Let's create other ones that will um, start from a place of care and start from a place of health um, so that all of us can have the opportunity to be healthy. Yes, I'm with you there. I want to go back to something that was spoken about at the beginning of our conversation, uh, or at least debt was brought into the conversation. And one of the undergirds of our social structure is debt. And in Inflamed, you explain both the colonial dependence upon debt economies in order to create structure and control, and the continuation of these debt practices to uphold capitalism. We see this as a uh, you know, through line to our present day where so many people carry massive amounts of debt because of our poor systems of care. This is especially harmful when we consider the staggering amount of medical debt that exists in the United States. And yeah, I'd just love to hear your thoughts on the interconnected nature of debt and health. And really, when the cure is unaffordable and debt inducing, how can we possibly heal? Well, we can't. Uh, I mean, you're, you're right, Ayana, that uh, debt has always been uh, an important technology of colonialism. You know, in, in Malawi, for instance, uh, when the, the British came and needed workers, uh, what they did was, was very simple. They just imposed a hut tax uh, that uh, initially families paid off by selling off their livestock. And once uh, they had sold everything that could be sold, they were left with the only thing left, which was uh, their labor power. And so in order to discharge the debt that the British had imposed on them, all of a sudden they found themselves working in mines, working on plantations, working uh, in ways that befitted, uh, better benefited the, the, the British Empire. And that technology uh, persists. Um, you know, uh, and it, I think what, what one of the, the greatest tricks of uh, colonial capitalism has been to pretend that uh, there are certain debts that can be and should be discharged and certain ones that can't. So uh, although Britain extracted from India $45 trillion worth of, uh, of, of material and wealth, uh, that's not a debt that Britain ever thinks that can be repaid. But what Britain can insist on uh, is that the kind of debts that it uh, is able to um, control through its membership of the board of the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank. Uh, those kinds of debts cannot be discharged. They can be postponed as they were in, in a moment of very brief and very frugal generosity in, um, under COVID. Uh, but in general, that kind of debt is not the, the sort of thing that the Global South has ever imagined to be able to free itself of. You know, there is not a politician in Britain or the United States or anywhere in the global north that can see an end to this uh, this process of uh, indebtedness. Uh, they'll never tell you that. They'll tell you, oh, yes, yeah, so we, we've got some, some very exciting uh, you know, uh, uh, debt forgiveness plans. But they know full well that this is just a temporary mechanism to merely uh, tamp down the wildly excessive numbers uh, for, of debt repayment. Um, but there will still there will never come an end point. Uh, where the South does not owe the North, whereas in fact, if one looks at climate change, if one looks at uh, species loss, if one looks at the future of the planet, it's entirely the case that the North owes the global South a great deal. Um, and that debt uh, is, you know, again, the, the product of colonial capitalism, uh, and it is writ large and it is writ small. It is writ small through the, 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 the debts that we bear every day. Um, but, you know, part of the, the technology of 
the future that we're excited about in uh, in inflamed is well what is it to imagine a different world and we can imagine a world where there is public health care. We can imagine a world where education is free. We can imagine a world with all of these things, and that world isn't too far away. I mean, look, you know, I mean, I grew up under free health care, um, and it's still racist, uh, but people don't die discharging themselves of medical debt that, that, that they do here in the United States, in the United States, oh, sorry, in the United Kingdom. The National Health Service, again, made possible by uh, trillions appropriated from everywhere else in the world, is nonetheless uh, an example of a service that is you know, available to everyone and beloved by everyone. And that was put into place, not because it was affordable, but because it was the only thing that conscience would allow, uh, which gets to Rupert's point, right? That, that you know, if, if it's too expensive to have healthcare for everyone, uh, then the numbers are being done wrong. But it is not the, the case that we can, in good conscience, allow ourselves to live on a planet where we are not caring radically for one another. Um, so, you know, the, the, it, the, the idea of debt and a debt jubilee is important. Uh, it is important that we recognize the debts that the global north owes the global south, that uh, that patriarchy has occasioned, that racism has occasioned, that uh, colonial, you know, that the, the stealing of the land on which we find ourselves has occasioned, uh, and repair and make reparation for that. Uh, but also that we recognize that, that you know, uh, that, that debt is a way in which capitalism maintains its power. Uh, and by declaring a jubilee, we might be free at least uh, from that element of, of capitalism's domination of our lives and free to dream something much better. Mm -hmm. Yes, I think dreaming something much better is necessary at this point. The imagination battle that we're living within needs to be uh, won by our dreams and imagination. So I, I'm really with you there. And hmm, yeah, it's, you know, we're just so obviously living in an afflicted world. And with this comes a longing for healing. However, modern medicine and cure-based initiatives often serve merely to treat symptoms. And in turn, this comes to reproduce many of the issues that caused the issues in the first place. For instance, you write, quote, trying to solve air pollution by creating more rich-only spaces with air conditioning and filtration just makes it worse for everyone, as the machines spew out heat and demand energy to generate electricity, burning more fossil fuels in order to protect the wealthy from the effects of the fires, end quote. So I'm wondering if you both could elaborate on this extractive and consumptive cycle and the ways deep medicine may liberate us from this. Yeah, it's, you know, it's funny that it's beyond the imaginings <laughs> because, you know, for example, here, you know, in the Bay Area in East Oakland, where I live, there is a, there is the, this foundry, the ABNI foundry that has been spitting toxic emissions into the air every Thursday. It smells really bad and all like throughout like this, like this like heavy cloud over East Oakland and people who live around the ABNI foundry um, get to experience a confluence of um, air polluting particles from the 880 um, freeway um, because all the trucks um, had to go down the 880, not in the, um, th over the 580, which is parallel to the 880, but it has more white people living around it. Um, so the flatlands of Oakland really get crammed with, um, multiple, uh, chronic air polluting impacts. Um, but the ABNI foundry puts a particularly toxic, um, you know, hexavalent chromium, which is a heavy metal aerosolized into the air. It's been associated with cancer um, and, and other health problems. And when you look at the life expectancy of people who live near that foundry, that's 10 years less than the people who live up by the 580 um, freeway. Um, so these things have like real impact on our health. We also learned that the combined impact of air pollution and um, like chronic air pollution and COVID, that people who were exposed to chronic air pollution ended up having more severe outcomes when they got COVID. And then we learned that the people who were forced to breathe the toxic air from the wildfires also had um, worse outcomes with COVID. Um, and there was also concern that the actual virus was traveling on the uh, particulate matter um, and spreading along um, the particulate matter from wildfires and air pollution. 
So when you see the confluence of these things, you just realize like what a disaster um, this is and has been um, for people, you know, and looking at the maps of COVID in Alameda County, it's those people who live around the foundry. Again, um, the people who are in the flatlands of Oakland who are having the worst outcomes from COVID. And so we have these spare the air days in, in the Bay Area where you're not allowed to burn your fireplace. But on spare the air days, the ABNI foundry continues to, you know, release its, unleash its toxic um, load into the air in that area. And it just always has befuddled me. I, you know, I've spoken to the county health department. I've spoken to the mayor of Oakland. I've spoken, I, I have talked to everybody about this health hazard and the uh, going all the way up to the California EPA, the US EPA, um, and the inability to act on industry. Um, oh, well, they have a special title exemption to pollute our air. Um, oh, well, we can't do that because it's not under our jurisdiction. Oh, it's not a health, we can't like make a health order. Um, so the levels of inability to act to stop toxic industry is shocking in the United States. And you can see the same with PG&E, like how many people does PG&E get to kill with its wildfires? And they're still operating. They're still working. You know, if I was killing that many people in the hospital, I would lose my license. Um, so how do these industries get the free pass to work with such abandon, reckless abandon, um, and um, endanger our lives? So these are things that, you know, it's, it's easier for people to imagine to letting PG&E continue than just shutting them down and starting to build microgrids throughout California um, based on, you know, small solar um, community owned energy um, entities. Um, so that kind of uh, the, 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 the shift in perspective has to come from the ground up. It's not going to come from the politicians. Um, the whole COVID response here in California was being really overseen by healthcare lobbyists who were representing the executives and the healthcare systems that made record profits as our nurses were standing in trash bags. So this whole um, where the power lies in our society is um, it's been constructed in this way and it will take a great deal of effort from the ground up to change it. And that's what needs to be done at this point. Yeah, it's interesting. We've been talking about so many facets that have created this disease in us and especially within marginalized communities. And I'm thinking about trauma and, you know, we've spoken to trauma in different ways, but I wonder if you could explain how our health and especially marginalized communities health reveals the cycles of violence and both generational trauma and inequity. Well, trauma is, is, is really registered and held in the body and manifested through chronic inflammatory states. And so all the diseases that we're talking about in our book, Inflamed, are diseases that are really impacted by trauma. And what it was really uh, striking for me to learn about and to research more deeply in writing this book was how trauma is translated down on into the cellular level of our bodies. It's literally changing the way our cells act and how they express 
these, these molecular mediators that drive inflammation in our body. So trauma and healing from trauma is critical in this work. It's critical that we both stop the causes of trauma and simultaneously engage in uh, methods to heal the trauma. This way, you know, for the medical community to learn about trauma, to learn about how medicine itself has been an act of, you know, a traumatizing experience for lots of different kinds of people. Once we are leading with the trauma-informed lens, um, it can it can shift and change the dynamics in medicine and how we heal and and what we are able the the array of uh, possible therapeutics we can offer to people to help them move their bodies and move their lives into a place that can heal from trauma. The other thing that really surprised me in this work in this research was how our bodies can heal. That you know the 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 damage that happens to the body that generates the inflammatory response when that damage is stopped when you move into a dynamic that is no longer damaging that is restoring that that inflammation can can be soothed and that is the hope is that the knowledge that we can construct other ways and it can look as simple as you know, not as simple, but as small as a public smoking ban. Here's an example of, you know, something that happened in California. We banned public smoking. It took a couple decades because of the fight with the tobacco industry that wanted to, you know, continue to allow people to be poisoned by their products. But once California instituted its public smoking ban, rates of fatal heart attacks and strokes dropped actually dropped more than what we'd seen from any medic medicine, any pharmaceutical, any uh, cardiovascular research, uh, interventional, whatever that we do, the fancy things we do in medicine, just simply saying you can't smoke in public. That kind of action is a policy level design of the world around us that had radical impacts or transformative impacts on our bodies. So if we can do that with smoking, can we do that with pesticides? Can we do that with eliminating all of the inputs into our soil that damage our soil microbiology? Because we know as fossil fuel-based inputs are put into the soil, they damage the, the fungal to bacterial ratio. They make that, that um, you know, you get less of the del- delicious glomulin, um, which is a glycoprotein secreted by fungi to hold the soil together and act as a sponge. That those, those beautiful, um, ecological relationships in the soil are destroyed through the use of these chemicals. They're the same chemicals that are driving up global temperatures. So when we can decide, you know, these industries can no longer be allowed to privatize the gains and socialize the costs uh, because we are paying for it. I just drove through Kern County um, last week on Indigenous Peoples Day and so much of the soil was in the air. California is turning into a dust bowl because of these, um, agricultural practices. So this is an important time to start imagining how we redesign our world by dethroning the industries that have been wreaking havoc on public health for centuries. And by demanding our place and our right to be healthy and our right for our grandchildren, our great-grandchildren to breathe healthy air and to drink healthy water. Um, and so that insistence is growing and it, and it must grow a lot stronger and all of the tactics of movement building and organizing will be required. Um, and so it's an important time to start getting involved. Mm-hmm. Yes, I couldn't agree more. And I was so struck by your explanation that, quote, colonial cosmology sees things where persons once were. What once was alive with personhood, a forest, a river, a mountain, becomes inanimate, disconnected from ecologies, open to exploitation in the United States. This mindset is enshrined into law, end quote. And as we conclude, I think it's particularly important to remember that You both recognize the importance of medicine and health beyond the social constructions of capitalism and 
colonialism and racism in which they currently reside. And there is hope for a medicine that brings us closer to the earth and to healing. So I would just love if you could paint a picture of what health and perhaps even more importantly, care looks like from the perspective of deep medicine. Well, deep medicine is recognizing that health exists beyond individuals. Health is an emergent phenomenon of systems within systems working um, in their optimum state. So we can try to get health as an individual, but we will not be as um, successful as getting health for whole communities together and how communities intersect. And by that, I mean human and the more than human communities. I mean, the water and, and the air and the microbes and the, and the forest. And so deep medicine is understanding how all of those things must intersect to create health and that we have to open our um, perspectives and our ways of knowing to all the keepers of deep medicine, not just the, you know, the doctors or the, the healthcare workers that are farmers, that are, um, that are frontline, you know, indigenous grandmothers standing up against line three right now, that these are all health. These are all people working for health. And that these, um, when we work together and collectively and across disciplines together, we can create a different kind of reality. We can create a health for everybody. When we start imagining food as a right, as it has been for thousands of years before capitalism, where our food and medicine have always been coexistent, they haven't been separated from each other. And they're still that way in many cultures around the world. When we insist upon our medicine um, being outside of the tiny vocabulary of pharmaceuticals, not that we abandon science, Western science, or we abandon even those pharmaceuticals, but that we abandon the logic of domination that they have been structured by, and that we take back our right to have access to these things to be healthy when we need them, and that we incorporate the full range of languages and vocabularies of medicines be they plant medicines, medicines of song, medicines of relationships, in order to achieve a vision and a, and a reality of our health. So these, you know, practices are not, um, you know, just, I'm not just talking about things that don't exist. These are things that are an active practice in communities around the world today. And so how do we connect with and work and learn with those communities to advance their health agendas, especially our indigenous communities in their territories. Today, I'm speaking to you um, from the occupied and unceded Ramatush Loni territory, um, what is now called San Francisco. And we are working um, with an organization we formed called the Deep Medicine Circle with indigenous people and settlers together, working to decolonize our food and medicine. And that project, that work has been so beautiful um, because it shows how it sometimes it's just a simple uh, imagining. And that's what we were talking about in the book is like the importance of exercising our imaginations, of looking to art and looking to um, other ways of knowing that can lift our vision up a little bit higher so that we can see beyond the enforced horizons of colonial capitalism to another world that's sitting there waiting for us, you know, with open arms and, and that world needs us really badly right now. Mm -hmm. Yes. Oh, Rupa, I'm so appreciative that you took us through some really intense and challenging topics, but you're leaving us with this vision. And I would say for me, like a type of confidence that another world is possible and we just need to be brave and bold and consistent and believe that we can do this together and we can change the system that is, you know, uh, kind of strangle holding us a bit. So, um, yeah, I just really appreciate this listening journey you took us through and thank you so much for your work and your devotion and your dedication and Raj, uh, I, you know, really appreciate you too. I know he had to jump to a class, but um, so grateful to you both and for your book Inflamed. And I really, really want listeners to go pick up that book 
um, and dive deeper. And again, it's inflamed deep medicine and the anatomy of injustice. Thank you so much for, um, for giving us an opportunity to talk about this book. Ayana, thanks for your awesome work. Thank you for listening to For the Wild podcast. The music you heard today was by Roma Ransom and Lindsay Mills. For the Wild is created by Ayana Young, Erica Ekram, Francesca Glassbell, and Julia Jackson. 